Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I have gathered three horror stories for you to listen to. I hope you enjoy them. If you love stories like these, please give us a like. And if you want to support the channel, please subscribe. Thank you so much for all the support. Now, on with the stories. Harry Houdini's life was marked by the pursuit of the impossible. Born Eric Weiss in Budapest, Hungary in 1874, he emigrated to the United States with his family when he was just a child. As he grew up in the streets of New York, young Eric, later taking the name Harry Houdini, discovered an intense passion for performance. By the early 1900s, he had become a household name across America and Europe, defying seemingly unbeatable odds and feats that shocked and captivated audiences. Known as the Handcuff King, Houdini's fame spread as he freed himself from locked chains, underwater chests, and straitjackets. His acts weren't merely tricks, they were tests of physical and mental endurance, rooted in painstaking preparation and extraordinary skill. Houdini didn't just entertain, he performed miracles in front of audiences who had come to believe that he was practically indestructible. His skills seemed otherworldly, however, Houdini insisted his abilities were a result of hard work, not the supernatural. His skepticism toward the supernatural defined much of his later life. When in the early 20th century, the practice of spiritualism swept across America and Europe, many prominent people believed mediums could contact the dead. But Houdini believed these mediums were con artists, preying on grieving families for money. His mission became clear. He would use his fame and skill to expose fraudulent mediums, devoting years to exposing those he saw as fakes. He even testified before Congress lobbying to ban mediums who profited from claims of contacting the deceased. This crusade would bring Houdini fame but also dangerous enemies. In 1926, Houdini embarked on a grueling North American tour. At 52, he was not as young as he once was, but his schedule was as intense as ever. Performing night after night, he pushed his body to the limits. By October of that year, he found himself in Montreal, where he was to give a performance at the Princess Theatre. During his stay, he visited McGill University to give a lecture to students about his career and his efforts to debunk spiritualism. After the lecture, he retired to his dressing room, where he entertained a small group of McGill students eager to meet the famed magician. Among them was J. Gordon Whitehead, a student who was particularly curious about Houdini's strength and tolerance for pain. Houdini had often boasted that he could withstand almost any blow to his abdomen due to his training. Whitehead took it upon himself to test that claim. Witnesses later recounted that Whitehead struck Houdini in the abdomen multiple times. The blows took Houdini by surprise, and though he brushed them off, he soon began feeling severe discomfort. He had never had a chance to brace himself, which experts believe may have exacerbated his injury. Despite the pain, Houdini continued on with his tour. He boarded a train to Detroit for his next scheduled performance, battling worsening pain and a growing fever. When Houdini arrived in Detroit, he was seriously ill, but he insisted on performing. That night, October 24, 1926, he took to the stage at the Garrick Theater, visibly struggling but determined to complete his routine. As he performed, his fever spiked, and his condition became impossible to ignore. Afterward, his wife Bess and his assistants urged him to see a doctor, and he was soon diagnosed with acute appendicitis, a condition requiring immediate surgery. Despite the recommendation, Houdini initially refused to seek treatment, reluctant to cancel his shows and disappoint his audiences. Only when his health declined further did he agree to go to the hospital. When surgeons finally operated, they found that Houdini's appendix had ruptured and he was suffering from peritonitis, a life-threatening infection in his abdominal cavity. In those days, medicine could do little to combat infections of this severity. Though his doctors tried, Houdini's condition worsened. In the hospital, surrounded by his wife and closest friends, he fought to stay alive, but on October 31st, 1926, ironically, on Halloween, Harry Houdini passed away. He was 52 years old. Houdini's death shocked the world. News quickly spread, and fans mourned the passing of a man they saw as invincible. Yet the circumstances surrounding his death sparked speculation. Many wondered if the blows he received from Whitehead might have triggered his condition. Some theorists believe the punch may have caused the appendix to rupture, or at least worsened an existing condition. However, without modern diagnostic tools, 
the true role of the incident remains uncertain. The mystery didn't end there. Some believed there was more to Houdini's death, given his crusade against spiritualism and the powerful people he had angered in the process. He had exposed famous mediums as frauds and publicly clashed with well-known believers, making him enemies among spiritualists who viewed him as a threat. Though some suspected foul play, no evidence ever emerged to support these claims, and modern experts agree that the incident with Whitehead likely contributed to his death. In the years following Houdini's passing, his wife, Bess, sought to contact her late husband from beyond the grave. She held annual seances on Halloween, hoping to hear from the man who had made it his life's mission to expose those who claimed to speak with the dead. For ten years she waited, but Houdini never returned. Ten years is long enough to wait for any man, she declared, ending the tradition. Though she did not succeed in contacting him, these seances kept Houdini's memory alive, blending the legend of the master escapist with the mystery of the supernatural that he had so fervently fought to disprove. Harry Houdini's legacy endures to this day. His death remains one of the most mysterious in early 20th century entertainment history. Whether it was an unfortunate accident, a tragic complication of illness, or something more, Houdini's life and death continue to fascinate and inspire, reminding the world of a man who dared to escape the unescapable and challenge the unknown. The story of the Mary Celeste, one of history's most haunting maritime mysteries, begins in the port city of New York in the fall of 1872. The Mary Celeste was a sturdy brigantine built to weather the rigors of the Atlantic. It was neither new nor inexperienced. In fact, the ship had already sailed many successful voyages. Its captain, Benjamin Briggs, was well respected in the maritime community, a man of unwavering discipline, keen intelligence, and a deep sense of duty. From a family of seafarers, Captain Briggs was no stranger to the challenges posed by the open sea. His wife Sarah and their young daughter Sophia were to accompany him on this voyage, adding a personal significance to the journey. The crew Briggs selected was carefully chosen for their skill and loyalty. All seven of them were seasoned sailors, and each had a solid reputation. Together, they formed a strong team, well equipped for the journey from New York to Genoa, Italy. On November 7, 1872, the Mary Celeste set sail from Pier 50 in New York Harbor, loaded with a substantial cargo of industrial alcohol. The intended route was well-traveled and reasonably safe, and though winter was approaching, no immediate storms were on the horizon. Captain Briggs noted the ship's course and initial progress with the diligent precision he was known for, recording it daily in the ship's logbook. The journey began smoothly, and there were no indications of trouble. In fact, for the first three weeks, the Mary Celeste sailed without incident, making steady progress toward its destination across the Atlantic. The last entry in Briggs' logbook was recorded on November 25th, placing the ship about 400 miles from the Azores, a group of islands in the North Atlantic. It would be the last known communication from anyone aboard the Mary Celeste. On December 5th, 1872, just under a month after the Mary Celeste set sail, a British brigantine named the De Gracia was navigating the North Atlantic on a route similar to the Mary Celeste's. Captain David Morehouse, an acquaintance of Briggs, was in command. Late in the day, a crew member aboard the De Gratia spotted a ship on the horizon, drifting oddly in the water with its sails partially set. The sight of a ship adrift in this way was unusual and concerning. Morehouse, immediately curious, ordered the crew to steer closer. As they approached, the crew of the De Gratia realized that the drifting vessel was none other than the Mary Celeste. Morehouse, familiar with Briggs and his reputation, was shocked to find the ship in such a state. It seemed adrift, with no one visible on deck and no signals or signs of life. Morehouse ordered a boarding party, and several crew members climbed aboard the Mary Celeste to investigate. What they discovered was both eerie and perplexing. The Mary Celeste appeared to be completely deserted. There was no sign of Captain Briggs, his family, or the crew. Their personal belongings remained untouched, giving no indication of a hurried departure or struggle. The ship itself was in reasonable condition, showing only minor wear and tear. There was some damage to the sails and rigging, but the vessel was entirely seaworthy. The ship's provisions, enough food and fresh water to last six months, were intact, 
and the crew's quarters and the captain's cabin remained well kept. More peculiar still, the cargo of industrial alcohol, which was valuable and would have likely been targeted in the case of piracy, was largely undisturbed. The one critical detail that stood out to the boarding party was the absence of the ship's lifeboat, suggesting the crew might have abandoned ship. But for what reason? The Mary Celeste was in no apparent distress, and nothing indicated a disaster that would compel a hasty departure. The crew found Briggs's logbook, where his detailed entries noted the ship's location and progress. The last entry, recorded on November 25th, indicated that the Mary Celeste had been about 400 miles away from its current location. Somehow, in just over a week, it had drifted unattended, yet still seaworthy, across miles of open ocean. With no immediate answers, Morehouse decided to sail the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar, where British authorities conducted an official investigation. At Gibraltar, a thorough investigation into the Mary Celeste's abandonment began. Maritime inspectors and authorities examined every inch of the vessel, hoping to find a clue, a hidden sign of what might have forced an experienced captain like Briggs to leave his ship. The inquiry ruled out piracy, noting that valuables and cargo were untouched. There was also no evidence of violence or mutiny on board. With no signs of immediate danger, the authorities turned to theories that might explain what happened on the Mary Celeste. Some experts speculated that an explosion of alcohol fumes from the cargo could have spurred Briggs to order an evacuation. The barrels of alcohol were made from red oak, which is porous, and could allow fumes to leak into the ship. If the crew noticed the fumes, they might have feared an explosion and used the lifeboat to distance themselves from the ship temporarily. However, there was no sign of any actual explosion, and the empty lifeboat suggested they might have encountered an unforeseen difficulty while off the ship making it impossible for them to return. Another theory is that a natural phenomenon like a water spout or a sudden rogue wave struck the Mary Celeste, creating conditions that frightened the crew into abandoning ship. These rogue waves could have caused the bilge to take on water, possibly misleading Captain Briggs into thinking the ship was sinking faster than it actually was. However, none of these explanations fully accounted for the state in which the Mary Celeste was found or why experienced seafarers would abandon a seaworthy ship so far from any land or safety. After months of scrutiny, the British Admiralty Court reached an official verdict of unexplained abandonment, an unusual and vague conclusion that left the mystery unsolved. The court had found no evidence of criminal activity, foul play, or any reason that might definitively explain the abandonment. The Mary Celeste was eventually released and continued to sail for years after the incident, but her story had already transformed into one of legend. The mystery of the Mary Celeste's missing crew and passengers became a subject of fascination, a story told and retold with a sense of eerie wonder. To this day, the fate of Captain Briggs, his family, and his crew remains one of the greatest mysteries of the sea, captivating the imaginations of maritime historians and curious minds alike. In 1938, the American people were growing accustomed to hearing major news through their radios, the primary source of entertainment, information, and even community connection during the Great Depression. People tuned in for news bulletins, soap operas, serial dramas, and late-night orchestras, with their favorite programs forming a familiar part of daily life. The radio had become a trusted voice in American homes, providing a mix of news and storytelling that was unprecedented. The audience tuned in to CBS and other networks came to rely on the integrity and reliability of broadcasters for immediate updates. So, when they were told about an emergency or an invasion, they had little reason to doubt it. It was against this backdrop that the Mercury Theater on the Air, a relatively new radio drama program created by 23-year-old Orson Welles, decided to adapt H.G. Wells's classic science fiction novel, The War of the Worlds. Wells's book, first published in 1898, imagined an invasion from Mars that threatened humanity, and the novel itself was a thrilling cautionary tale about human vulnerability. Orson Welles and his writer, Howard Koch, wanted to bring this story to life, yet they knew their adaptation had to stand out. To achieve a unique and striking effect, they restructured the War of the Worlds as a series of live news bulletins, bringing the story from Victorian England to modern-day America, setting it in rural New Jersey. This adaptation would take on the form of realistic news reports, 
something they hoped would captivate audiences by placing them right in the center of the unfolding events. The Halloween broadcast aired on October 30th, 1938, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The opening of the show was straightforward, featuring an introduction that set the stage for the story. However, most listeners were not tuned in at this moment. Many were listening to a popular program on NBC and only turned the dial to CBS when it went to a commercial break about 12 minutes into the War of the Worlds broadcast. By that point, Wells's introduction was over, and the program had transitioned into what sounded like a live news report, urgently interrupting music to describe strange happenings on the surface of Mars. The first bulletins described unusual activity, such as gas explosions and flashes of light, captured by astronomers observing Mars. The program then returned to regular music, only to break again with another news flash describing a strange metallic object that had fallen to Earth near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. The simulated report grew more intense with each interruption, as broadcasters reported the gradual discovery of alien technology, strange biological creatures, and, ultimately, an impending threat to humanity. The sounds of panicked reporters, the clamor of bystanders, and descriptions of the unknown lent an eerie, compelling realism to the broadcast that seemed all too real. Although the Mercury Theater included several disclaimers throughout the program, a large portion of listeners tuned in mid-broadcast and missed these announcements. Many began to believe that the United States was genuinely under siege by extraterrestrial invaders. The simulated nature of the show became an afterthought, as listeners reacted to the news bulletins in real time, creating scenes of confusion and chaos. Some listeners contacted local authorities, asking for guidance on evacuation plans or shelter options. Others attempted to reach family members and friends, not realizing that the invasion they feared was only fictional. Reports from that night indicate that some listeners gathered in the streets, particularly in New York and New Jersey, where the supposed Martian landing was said to be occurring. Families huddled around their radios, unsure of how to respond, while some prepared themselves to defend against what they believed to be an imminent attack. Panic spread across different cities, and there were reports of people fleeing their homes, packing up to escape what they believed was a deadly invasion. Newspapers the following day were filled with stories detailing the hysteria that spread throughout parts of the country. Headlines captured the chaos, describing families fleeing their homes and highways filled with people desperately seeking to escape. The newspapers, competing with radio for readership, seemed to seize upon the incident, at times amplifying the story by portraying it as an outpouring of national terror. In reality, not all listeners were panicked. Some were aware it was a drama, and others simply changed the station if they found it too unsettling. However, for those who did believe, the consequences were very real, and the stories that emerged became legendary in their own right. The broadcast triggered immediate backlash. In the days that followed, CBS and Wells faced strong criticism for what many called an irresponsible prank. The Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, launched an investigation into the event, though it ultimately did not take any legal action. Nonetheless, the FCC's involvement signaled a turning point for broadcast regulation. In response to the public reaction, radio networks implemented stricter rules requiring clear disclaimers and transparency for all future broadcasts, especially if they contained dramatic or fictional material that could be mistaken for news. This incident highlighted the need for greater accountability in media, as radio and other mass communication tools began to expand their influence. At a press conference, Orson Welles himself addressed the reaction. Expressing a mixture of surprise and regret, he claimed he had no idea his broadcast would be taken as a factual report, though he admitted he was aware of the realness of the portrayal. While he had not anticipated the extent of the panic, he acknowledged that the realism of the format may have affected listeners in unforeseen ways. Ultimately, the incident marked a turning point in Wells' career, giving him both notoriety and a larger audience that would help propel him to future projects, including his iconic film, Citizen Kane. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Thank you for listening.